Hello once again to friends and acquaintances at the liveactionanime.org forums. I am once more Thrashed All Death, and this is the second part of my abandonment of any integrity I may once have had as an amateur critic, and my descent into self-aggrandizing narcissism. So, now that that's out of the way, here's the deal. See, I'm actually kind of out of material uh, to review at the moment. Most of the anime I own is either up at my student flat, where I am not at the moment, or I need to deal with in writing as opposed to video for one reason or another. So I thought I'd do something just a little bit different today, do something I don't normally do, and review a manga. So Oaken Volchok, you can rest easy. You're not the only ones being ripped off anymore. Now I'm stealing noodles as shtick too. So yeah, normally I don't deal with manga because I find that in manga, more so than anime, there's a much greater proliferation of shit. Now I don't deny that there have been some great stories that have emerged from a medium, but for every Akira or Lone Wolf and Cub, there seem to be like 20 other examples of just tired reworkings of old shonen cliches. But this one's different. This is something that's grabbed my attention. It's called Lament of the Lamb, Hitsuji no Uta, as it's known in Japan. And this is a seven-part manga in 47 chapters, written by Kei Tume. And yeah, as I said, it grabbed my attention. It's something very different. And I thought I'd just talk to you about that for a while. It follows the life of this kid, Kazunu Takashiro, and he's just leaving high school, going into college. He's been raised by foster parents for most of his life, and he has only the vaguest memories of his birth parents and of the older sister who've left him behind to just find his own way in the world. But the manga starts with him one day on a whim just going back to the house where he was born. And here he discovers his older sister, who tells him that both of his parents have been dead, and he discovers just why he was left behind as a child. His family's bloodline has, for generations, been tainted by this genetically inherited disease, which makes its inheritors crave for other people's blood. It gets called vampirism. Yeah, exactly. But this isn't like vampirism, Bram Stoker style. It's, you know, it's just the thirst for blood, none of the other stuff. None of the can't go out in daylight, pale skin, sharp teeth, that kind of thing. So, yeah, first thing you should know about this thing is that a lot of the sort of cliches of gothic culture are very much present, very prevalent even. So, yeah, if seeing a lot of frames of people with fringes sitting around, around looking broody isn't your thing, don't bother. This isn't the manga for you. And a lot of the, yeah, cliches are present. There, there is the sort of overused use of vampirism as a metaphor for sexuality. And in this story, blood is basically interchangeable with semen. You can basically read all of the scenes of blood sucking just that way exactly without any extra layers of subtlety involved. But I will say this. I've always had sort of a guilty affinity for gothic culture. I've Although I'll admit that 90% of it is just wallowing in self-pity that just doesn't really have any artistic validity. But Lament of the Lamb is different. It's, it represents both an apotheosis of those aesthetics and a validation of them. This is actually a very strong story and although it's very angsty, it's not the kind of cut and dried hot topic angst that we've all come to know in, like, know and hate in the last few years. It's much more My Dying Bride than 
My Chemical Romance. And although you, you don't get that sort of revelry in the sort of mundanity of teenage, teenage life, it's not it's not wallowing in self-pity the way that all these other sort of vampire stories do. It, it actually does take the time to build up strong characters and a really refined sense of quite a strange and really quite moving sort of sadness. So, in that sense it's quite a strong story. The narrative is very sparse. It's, um, a lot of it isn't charted so much by actions as it is by sort of peaks and valleys of emotion. And it's a testament to just how bleak this story is, that even at its cheeriest, it's still very sombre, while at its darkest, like at the end of the third volume, it's just touching upon absolute nihilistic despair. The artwork, generally speaking, is quite sketchy, quite sparse, but that, that actually works here. It's the lack of detail just sort of fills in the sort of slow-moving narrative and complements it nicely, just the sort of ghost-like nature of the characters' lives. And the translation, done by Tokyo Pop, of course, is sort of, you know, hazy for the first couple of volumes. A lot of characters' motivations aren't very clear, simply because the dialogue, I don't think, has been really translated correctly, but that does start to clear up later on. For one thing, like, in the first couple of volumes, it get the disease gets referred to out and out as vampirism, and the Takashiros as vampires. But even in, much later on in volume six, it actually explicitly said these people are not vampires. So yeah, the one major complaint I have is with the story's ending. Now, in the last part of the seventh volume. You actually get an interview with the author, Kay Toon, and she says that uh, she had decided at like the last minute to opt instead for a optimistic ending rather than the pessimistic one she'd originally had in mind. And that's exactly what it comes across as being, a last minute, last ditch attempt to change things. Without wanting to give anything away, a character whose arc had, and had really found its way to its sort of logical, profound, and very moving conclusion is suddenly and arbitrarily given a second chance. And this last chapter makes no sense on either a narrative level or a logical one. And if you're reading this for the first time, I would actually advise you to actually stop at the penultimate chapter and just ignore the last one that it exists, because that way you'll actually get a much more satisfying, much more resolved ending to the story. But other than that complaint, I would recommend this manga quite strongly to anyone who's into this kind of thing. I'm not going to give it a score, because as I say, I'm not really qualified to really judge manga, I lack a frame of reference. But it is a strong story. I'll actually go out on a limb here and say that it's possibly one of the strongest examples of vampire fiction I've come across since Interview with a Vampire. Not that a lot of the competition's been very strong, if you know what I mean. Referring here to a particular blockbuster that's recently been polluting cinemas, which is basically this, with its balls chopped off. So. Yeah, just take that and add goodness, and that's basically Lament of the Lamb. So, anyway, this is Thrashed All Death, signing off. Hope you've all had a great Christmas, and I hope you all have a happy new year. Goodbye.